Peace and welcome to the culture right here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Faraji Muhammad. Today, folks, we got a lot of great conversations. Let's first talk about this mask mandate when traveling. Do you think it's going to affect how you move and travel, especially as we're getting into the warmer weather? We'll have that conversation. Also, let's talk about the vice president, the former vice president. Did you know that there were more lobbyists approaching Mike Pence, the former vice president, than any other vice president in history? I'm going to tell you why that is the situation. And then later on, we talk about the case of Patrick Loyola, Lyoya, and in this case of how a simple traffic stop leads to another fatal murder. We'll check in with Dr. Tyrone Powers, a former FBI agent, to give us some insight on this whole dynamic and if we need to rethink how traffic is done. That and a whole lot more is going to be coming at you. So stay with us. We got a lot to get to today right here on The Culture, only here on the Black Star Network. You ready to rock and roll? I'm ready to go. So let's go. Folks, welcome, welcome, welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. Oh, my goodness. We got so much to talk about because of uh, some of these big stories. We're going to kick off the conversation today discussing the mass mandates that have been lifted on planes. And I'm asking the big question, will it change how you travel, folks, especially now? I mean, spring break is is for some is, has already happened and for others is going to be happening. And then we're going to get into the summertime. And at the same time of all of these things, of course, there are a number of cities across the country where they're starting to see a rise of COVID cases again. So this new mass mandate that has just been determined to be the uh, uh, to be to be a a big change and what some would think is a sign of the endemic of this pandemic. But others are saying we may not be ready for all of that just yet. Uh, There has been a number of people across the uh, social media space and in other places that have kind of pushed back a little bit on this mass mandate. I want to, I want to, I want to first show us our, the founder of Black Star Network. He's not taking no chances, folks. (laughs) Big brother Roland Martin is not taking any chances. Check out what he posted today. Uh, This was earlier today. (laughs) He said, very simply, I don't give a damn what some grossly unqualified Donald Trump judge said. I'm double masked and wearing goggles on this Nashville to D.C. flight. I had COVID in December. Y'all can kiss my ass about me not wanting it again. And any fool saying they don't matter is a damn liar. Oh, you know who that is. That's Big Brother Roland Martin right there. That is Big Brother Roland Martin. So it's it's still, here's the thing, even though the mask mandate is there, folks, it is optional. It is optional. It is not required um, for, for everybody to wear masks. And I'm talking about for passengers, nor crew members, nor, nor staff of the airline. It's not required. So I, I wanted to put that out there because just to let people know that you can still wear a mask on, on, on planes. Now, which airlines have decided to cease mandatory masks? Check this out, folks. Let me just break it down to you. Uh, which airlines we got? Here we go. Delta, American, United, Southwest, Alaska, JetBlue, Spirit, Frontier, Allegiant Air, Hawaiian, Hawaiian Air, and uh, Sun Country Airlines have all ceased to require face masks, folks. All cease to require face masks. So are you, or do you feel safe to go onto a plane right now to not wear a mask right now on a plane? Do you feel that confident? Uh, I wanna go check in with my culture crew member, 
Iman Heath to give us her insight about this. Iman is an entrepreneur. She's an activist. And Iman, it's always good to talk to you on a Tuesday. I know it's been a couple of weeks since we last seen each other, so I'm glad that you're able to join us today. How are you? I am much better. I can breathe out my nose. My nose Great. isn't dripping. I'm much better. Good, 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 good. All right, so Iman, what's your take on this mass mandate being lifted on travel, on flights and, and travel? Um, do you feel like that this is the best tr- decision that people can make? And as and I showed a picture of Brother Roland Martin. He's yeah, he still has. he's still he, he he's still not playing no games. And I'm, I'm not, you know what? I have to say I agree with him. I'm not I'm not all the way there to believe so, that it's okay. But that's just me. But what you what's your take on it? I can definitely understand his take on getting COVID because COVID isn't fun for anybody. I had COVID uh, three times and wow. I don't, I, I wouldn't wish that on anyone. Now, luckily I didn't lose my, uh, not taste. Yeah, I didn't lose my taste or my smell. So I made it out pretty fine, but I don't blame him. You know, it increases having a mask on decreases your chances of spreading COVID or getting COVID, whether you're vaccinated or not. So I say in a, in a group of people, a bunch of people wear a mask, but it really should be everyone's discretion. Now, grand about think of your neighbor or how your neighbor may feel, um, especially our elderly people. But you should really leave it up to to the individual. If you want to run the risk of getting COVID, hey, take your chances. If you don't, wear a mask. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's one of the big things that uh, that's the big question that's facing a lot of people, and especially travelers in that right now. It's like you got to use the best intelligence and what works for you. And you have you know to know I mean? your health. You have to be realistic with your health. If you yeah. know that you're you're not, it's easy for you to get a cold or to easily get the flu, then you need yeah. to take more precautionary measures to uh, prevent those. For example, I take vitamin C every day. Like, taste right. like salt. I don't mm. like it. But to prevent me getting COVID for the fourth time, I take that. Yeah. Or at least change our nutritional value and what we, what we eat and what we intake. But you have to know your health and be honest with yourself. Don't go along with it. If everyone is saying, yeah, we're not going to wear our mask, don't wear the mask. No, if you don't feel comfortable, put your mask on. But it should be up to that individual. No doubt. No doubt. And I'm, I'm, I've am i always told people, man, like, you know, I'm a huge advocate of masks. I mean, and I get it. I know we've been wearing it for the past two years. And there are places where I'm like, all right, let me just take my mask off because I'm not going to be in close proximity with people. Mm-hmm. Um and, and, and I think the other part of it is, is that when you go into certain places, when I got COVID, I realized, and I, when you reflect on how you got it, you probably can pinpoint where you got it, right? If you, anybody Most got COVID, I, got, I had COVID, like you probably can pinpoint exactly when you, where you were, when yep. you got it. Yep. Because here's what I, this is one of the big pieces of that, uh, uh, trying to figure out I'm not trying to figure out, but like when you go into a space mm-hmm. and you you trying to de- de- trying to determine how the air is being circulated, how the air is being purified. Right. Let me yeah. just say, like most of your big box stores, for example, if you walk into a Walmart, if you go into your your local super uh, supermarket, they have those uh, the the HVAC system has the capacity, right, to be able right. to handle. You know, all of the stuff that's traveling through the air and getting it out. You know what I mean? Like most of the time they have the capacity. If you go into smaller places, you got to. Yeah. (laughs) Sometimes. And look, when I got COVID, I had the COVID twice. And when I got COVID the second time, I realized exactly where I was. And the building that I was in did not have the most. Uh, 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 you know, best, they didn't have the best HVAC system. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I know that that level, that contributed to how people got, you know, how I got COVID. Also, so it's, people not respecting yeah. the six foot rule. Like, first of all, I think it should be a six foot rule whether COVID is, we're in a p- pandemic or not. Back up. If I, I usually wear a long braid. If I move my hair to the back and I hit you, that's your fault. That means you're too close. So people don't respect the six foot rule. If if there was a three foot rule, people didn't respect it. So we also yeah. got to think about how other people handle their health. Do you wash your hands when you leave the bathroom? Or you wash your hands after you um, blow your nose? Do you use hand sanitizer frequently? Like to think of all the factors and variables that come into possibly catching COVID. I feel like the mask is just one extra step. But yeah, you you have to be worried. Starbucks in particular. 
in line at Starbucks. And there aren't very many Starbucks, at least in Baltimore, that are, uh, I would say, spacious for the capacity that Starbucks runs. You know, they busy. So they got the drive through line outside that's forever long. So you go inside and it's congested. People are sitting down, people are eating, so they don't have their mask on. Some of the employees don't have their mask on. And then right. in line, like I said, it's, you literally are, it's a, a small turn in most, the most uh, setups in Starbucks. And we're still close to each other. So I don't blame Roland Martin. Put the mask on. Put the damn mask on. Now here's Put a couple damn of damn mask on. <laughs> <Put the> damn. <laughs> and look, I know people, you know, I know people were upset with me about, you know, when we talked about COVID and everything when I was on Roland's show. But I would never have strayed away from the fact that I talked about wearing a mask. I was always about that. Wear your mask, stay, you know, stay six feet apart. Use the best of intelligence on how you're walking around and, 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 and dealing with and engaging with people. Uh, Janelle checked in on uh, on our YouTube channel, said, Faraji, that silly judge repealed the mandates on all federal Department of Transportation routes, buses, trains, planes. If folks were considerate and cared about one another, we wouldn't be here right now. It's not fair. I agree. I agree. You I agree. If I agree. Hard, you know what? And I mean, look, everybody is... Everybody wants to jump back to quote unquote normal. Mm. We'll never be normal again. No, we're never going to be. And, I, and I, you know what, like, Iman? I never understand. I never. I don't understand that. Like, we're never going to be normal again. And I know that's a hard pill for some people to to swallow. And we're two and a half years into this whole situation, but we're never going to be normal again. Not and the more you try to resist it, the more you try to fight it, the harder it gets for you to live day to day. You know what okay. I mean? It just gets you hot. I mean, at this point, you know, just take care of yourself. You know your body better than anybody else, right? Hopefully, Correct. you know your body. Correct. So, 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 if you know that that if you go into a space, if you're around people, that there is a high risk of you catching COVID, and mm -hmm. you may not, it may not be a fatal risk. It just might be a high risk, right? Mm -hmm. Then make the best decisions and use the best of intelligence to put the mask on or to distance yourself or to stay sanitized and keep washing your hands or just to, you know I mean? Limit how much you go out and be around a lot of people mm -hmm. and, and all of that. I know I they're need to, I go ahead. Need to wear the mask because you don't know about other people's, if they, other people who may have COVID or not, yeah. people, especially with springtime, just yeah. the sinus thing. And all of a sudden I suddenly have sinuses, you know, it's a bargain price to getting older. God said, I'm going to let you live, but listen, you got to take these allergies and sinuses with you. Okay, I guess, my God, that's what you want. But it's it's hard to tell, is this a regular cold? Do I have the flu? Yeah. Is it COVID-19? And then other people walking around, they don't care or they don't care to know or are scared to go to the doctors and find out because then you now have to miss work again. You now may have to make arrangements for your children. It may be more of a burden for you to know you have COVID than not to know. So at this point, due to people's ignorance as well, I say lean towards the mask. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> now, I want to I want to share some 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 additional thoughts on this and get your take on this, Iman, because you know when we first started talking about, and I'm saying in, in general, when there was a whole conversation about the mask mandate, it was originally set to expire on April the 18th, which is today. No, which is yesterday, yes. wasn't it? Yeah, yesterday. Yep. Uh, but then the CDC they decided to extend it through May 3rd because there are new rising COVID cases that are happening all across the United States. So that is still happening. So I think that that, and I think that's one of the big, I would say confusing points that people are trying to, to, you know, trying to break through and trying to understand because it's like, why lift the, the mask mandate if they're rising COVID cases? Right, exactly. And then what's the two-week difference of extending the mask mandate? What difference does that make if the yeah. COVID numbers are still rising? If yeah. you want, I want to go back to normal as much, much as possible, then if the mask has been working, and I think it should be at will, as, um, as they say, but if it was already working and, and, and it's, we're trying to go back to normal, then keep it that way. Why change it? Right. But some people are starting to think they just want they just want to rebel. Like just hell, I'm gonna go against the grain just because, or I'm not gonna follow the rules just because. Like think of the whole group. If we can all wear a mask and get this over with, 
I remember when we first shut down. Yeah. And I'm thinking everybody's still going outside. Everybody still want to go bar hopping. Don't get me wrong. I didn't want to be stuck in the house either. Right. But if you think of the collective and the group, if we all follow directions, and I don't agree with all the directions, however, if we at least move the majority of us in that direction, it'll help. The mask is the simplest way to protect yourself. It's the easiest way to protect yourself. You're not getting a shot. You're not getting anything injected inside of you that you may agree or disagree with. The mask is easy and simple. You have different colors that can match your outfit. You can get sparkly masks. You can get masks <laughs> with dazzle. You can get masks with stripes. Like, I don't see the issue. You can get masks to match your outfit. Like, what's, what is the problem? Put the mask on for the bigger group. <laughs> That's true. That's very true, Ma. That's very, very true. You can, you can, you can, you can coordinate. You can certainly coordinate. Um, but here's the other thing, and I and I want to get your take on this too, Ma. The other thing is that because this judge decides to 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 make this decision, which has led to the point that we're seeing right now, um, the Biden administration is looking to possibly challenge this decision. And um, you know they're 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 looking at it and they're they're talking about it according to uh, Dr. Celine Gounder, who is an infectious disease expert uh, and an editor at large for Kaiser Health News. They told CBS, you know, this morning that an appeal may be necessary given that the ruling could complicate how future pandemics are handled. So, what's your take on that? Do you think that? the Biden administration should challenge this decision, should challenge this ruling. Absolutely. To okay. number one, at least establish an example of what not to do. Don't allow, if it's better for the group, for everyone to wear a mask, then that's what you fight for. Just because I'm, I'm hearing, especially on social media, a lot of Americans are getting to the point where they're tired. They're tired. I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to wear, wear the mask anymore. I'm tired of buying masks. I'm tired of the hassle of the mask. I'm tired of leaving my car and having to run back to my car after I already got to the, the door of the store. I'm one of those. Not even going to lie. But I think they should challenge ch- challenge um, this ruling because it'll, again, set the example of any future, hopefully not so much, pandemics moving forward. Or it at least won't, uh, won't make Americans think that our health doesn't matter because if you're telling me the COVID cases are rising, but it's okay not to wear a mask, do you care about our health as a collective? Do you care about whether more Americans die off or not? So I think at least shows that the Biden administration cares about our, uh, about American citizens. So I think they should challenge it. That, that'll be one of the best things I think Joe Biden can do for his campaign to at least start start going into the positive. Because I remember when I uh, last time I was on with you guys, I feel like it's been forever. Right. Talking about how his 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 approval rating is plummeting. So I think that will at least will also help him stay face if he decides to run for uh, president again. Which we will have to see. And I think that. I don't think it's fair that people have put um, so much on President Biden about the handling of this pandemic. And here's why, I, here's, why, here's why I don't think it's fair. But Iman, here's why I don't think it's fair. And this is something that I see that, that is a cultural point in our politics in general. We expect political leadership to take things that are normally out of their hands in no way, shape, or form can they control, can they stop or add to, and we expect them to handle things a certain way, right? It's like the conversation that we have, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I hope folks, y'all follow me on this point. It's like the conversation that we have about anything from uh, health disparities to gun violence and, and, to, and violence in, a, in this country. You can't, the government is not equipped to handle certain certain issues because all of those big issues like a pandemic, that's not just a medical issue. Correct. That's a human behavior issue, Correct. right? I that's not you. just a policy issue, right? That is a health issue. So 
you can't expect, you can't put that on the doorstep. And I know people say, well, how has the president handled? This is uncharted territory. I would say the only, the only time. I mean, when have we had a pandemic? Since 1918. But the only benefit of the doubt that I could give Biden is the fact that he didn't start with the pandemic. So how you set the tone for the pandemic when we first got into the pandemic, well, when the pandemic first started, how it started and how the pre preventative measures and trying to be reactive, how it started may have been a disadvantage for Biden. But other than that, because of the, the, the seat that he, he holds, it, 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 I wouldn't imagine anybody else looking to anyone else to figure out, hey, what do we do? It's a part of his job. Like it comes with the territory. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that is that may be a part of his job and comes with the territory, but it's somewhat a kind of a bias or rather skewed measurement of his effectiveness because we have never been in this situation before, right? Gotcha. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Like we just never we haven't gotcha. we haven't been down this path before. Now, if there was another living president that said, oh, okay. Like he's setting the precedence. Trump sets the precedent on this, right? Because he was president when this whole thing kicked off. Trump right. set the precedent. Right. And then it was it was still early in this whole process. And then Biden had to inherit that. And I'm not right. saying that he, Biden, you know, didn't, you know, he he handles it the way he handles it. But my point is, is that getting out of the us get for us to get out of the space that we could take something that no one has control over and think that they that we can have control over. Like there are nations around this globe that are still trying to figure out the best way to manage COVID-19 right. and its various mutations. Right. And, and it gets into a place where it's like, what do you expect the president to be? A miracle worker? Like, no, he don't. The yeah, scientists we're not, we're not don't know what they I mean, they don't have, they have no idea. They can speculate. They can theorize. But at mm -hmm. the end of the day, they don't know. They are trying their best to figure it out. Just like us. Just like us. But it's it's hard for us to say definitively, boom, this is how you do it. Because everybody's yeah. getting it. You could be vaccinated, boosted, unvaccinated. We all getting it, right? Yep. Yep. And there's so 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 we are setting the precedent for another pandemic. More importantly, we're setting the precedent for how this country handles a massive public health crisis like COVID-19. Let me just say this very quickly, that the judge uh, and, and, you know, the judge that, that allowed this federal decision, Catherine Kimball Mizell, uh, she was nominated by Trump. And the American Bar Association, this is the nonpartisan group that rated her not qualified because of her lack of trial experience. So she's made this big decision and the American Bar Association has said she's not qualified as well. So I mean, it can, it's so political, yeah. Because yeah. and then it and then it spills over into the health and well being of the American people, and that's where the problem is. That's where yeah, that the politics we, override the health and well being of the people. It's like with chess pieces. We're just chess pieces, right? We're, 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 how can they benefit? How can we get closer to our territory that we need to get to? We're just chess pieces. That's that's what it's starting to feel like when you when you make the type of decision to lift a mandate when you know that there, ha there has been increasing rape in COVID cases. You don't care. I'm just a social security number. That's how some Americans may feel. I am just a social security number. Right, right. And uh, my hope is, and look, this is the only thing we could do. We we have some insight about how to, you know, manage living in this space. We, we mm -hmm. know with wearing masks and all of that. But at the end of the day, folks, just know that everybody is trying to find their way through this just like we are and it's just i always encourage do as much research as you can take care of yourself do your and use own the best research but do do look, and here, here the thing research. you could do your own research but make sure that you listen to trusted sources like make sure you don't go into the rabbit <laughs> hole because youtube will take you down a rabbit hole man just i mean use the best of in your intelligence man and this is the time that you talk to people, talk to your trusted doctors, medical advisors, the people that you personally trust and have a very real conversation with them at this point of it. Because I, I look, I, I can't tell you yes or no. I can only advise you based upon my personal experience. 
But guess right. what? We are still trying to figure this situation out even two and a half years later. Still trying to figure it out. All right, we got to take a quick break, Iman. When we come back, we're going to switch gears. I want to talk about, uh, outside of another thing of politics, dealing with the vice president. Vice Former Vice President Mike Pence was lobbied more than any other former vice president in history, in the history of the United States. I'm going to break it down as to why that is and when we come back. So stay with us. That conversation is coming up next here on The Culture, here on the Black Star Network. We'll be right back. Let me see. Maybe we're just having some technical difficulties. Waiting. I thought we had to take a break. (laughs) That's the beauty of live TV, man. We're going to. (laughs) I thought. All right, let me just check here. We're going to look. We have a little technical difficulty with streaming, with our stream. So it's not us, it's the stream, folks. Uh, but we're going to have that conversation. But I, I want to um, make sure. Let me just share with you what a couple of people have been saying about this whole to about this whole situation very quickly. Um, K. Grant said, "Look, I'm still wearing my mask. I'm a little fearful because I almost died from this disease. Understandable. People are still dying. The disease is only mild for those who are vaccinated. Um, yeah." I mean, it's understandable. I'm glad she made that point, though. I'm glad she mentioned being vaccinated, that you can still get and and you can still get uh, COVID. Like, it's still possible, but it's, it's still just, possible. Yeah, and I it's think the symptoms. I think that uh, for people just to be safe, like I said, use the best of intelligence, folks. Right. Um, Brother King Lee said, "Look, I'm fully vaccinated. I've never had COVID." However, I'm deeply concerned about some of the folks I personally who are fully vaccinated but continue to contract the virus. That's a very real concern. Absolutely. Very, very Absolutely. real concern. Uh, Nisa 1971 said, people are tired, but why? Tired of what? Of being considerate, feeling well, mm-hmm. showing kindness, not going to mm-hmm. funerals. And there is a brand new variant of Omicron in China. They ain't playing with it. Yeah, folks. So it still comes down to uh, making the best decision. You know your situation. You know your body. Make the best decision. We'll just stop it from right there. All right, let me just move on to this next segment real quick. Because, Iman, as we talked about this issue of politics, Mm -hmm. I always like to have these, like, off-beaten discussions about what's going on behind the scenes of politics Mm -hmm. because I think it's a great opportunity for us to learn about how our government truly, truly works. And this is a, something that um, I came across when um, when preparing for today's show was this idea of lobbyists. If you don't know what lobbyists are, folks, lobbyists are the people that go to government and put a couple of dollars in their pockets, Iman, for mm-hmm. various causes, for various interests. And they are the ones that kind of push the buttons on these politicians most times i'm not gonna say most but i will say a lot of people some of people in this country really don't understand the power of lobbyists right when you when you look at your elected official and you wonder why your elected official whether you're talking about a local local uh on a local level or on a national level why they decide to move on certain causes for certain things, right? Why they're pushing forward certain legislation. Is it just because that's what the quote unquote, the voters want, or is it because they are some special interest groups behind them that have said, look, if you put this to the people, or if you push this piece of policy or legislation, when it's time for you to uh, get reelected, we'll make sure we line those pockets. Lobbyists money come. Money gives you the power. Let me tell you, money gives you a lot of power in the American mm-hmm. and political system. Absolutely. And I think that uh, people oftentimes, Iman, and I'm just pulling up some information because I want to make sure that we have all that we need. A lot of times people don't, you know, we kind of, we talk about it, but we don't say, 
we don't say, well, why that is, or we don't go too deep into it. Money drives this political system, folks. Money drives America. America is a business. Yeah. It yeah. is a business. Who can give the most money? Who has the most money? Who be able to put the money in the highest bidder's pocket will have the highest advantage. It's about money. Money moves America. Money influences America. Money keeps America going. America is a business. Our government system is a business. Yeah. So, yes, lobbying is very important. But if you're going to lobby, you have to make sure you have some type of money to back that politician. Absolutely. Look, we're going to take a break now, Iman. When we come back, let's get more into the conversation. I'm going to break down the numbers for folks on how Mike Pence is the most lobbied uh, vice president in American history. Why is that the case? We'll talk a little bit about that. So stay with us, folks. We still got a lot to get to in the second 30 of the culture right here on the Black Star Network. We'll be right back. Don't you think it's time to get wealthy? I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show on the Black Star Network focuses on the things your financial advisor or bank isn't telling you. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. Pull up a chair, take your seat, the Black Tape. With me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network. Every week, we'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. Hi, I'm Dr. Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We'll laugh together, cry together, pull ourselves together, and cheer each other on. So join me for new shows each Tuesday on Black Star Network, a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. It's time to be smart. Roland Martin's doing this every day. Oh, no punches! Thank you, Roland Martin, for always giving voice to the issues. Look for Roland Martin in the whirlwind, to quote Marcus Garvey again. The video looks phenomenal, so I'm really excited to see it on my big screen. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. I got to defer to the brilliance of Dr. Carr and to the brilliance of the Black Star Network. I am rolling with rolling all the way. Honored to be on a show that you own, a Black man. <laughs> Owns the show. Folks, Black Star Network is here. I'm real uh, revolutionary right now. Rolling was amazing on that. Stay black. I love y'all. I can't commend you enough about this platform that you've created for us to be able to share who we are, what we're doing in the world, and the impact that we're having. Let's be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You can't be black on media and be scared. You dig? All right, folks, welcome back to the show. All right, let's talk a little bit about politics. Um, and I want to talk to us about some of the dark sides of politics, because we, we if you don't know, uh, this political system that we are all a part of, and as much as we might like to believe that we're not, we are all a part of this system in such a way that we don't understand the power, the power of the lobby and lobbyists are those individuals or those companies who go to our political officials political leadership and basically petition or quote unquote lobby for their uh, attention on a particular issue or particular cause and as a result of that some of those lobbyists will provide incentives for that politician to 
um, you know, push forth, a, a put forth a piece of legislation or to speak out on a certain issue or to speak for a certain issue. And so the lobbyists are one of the most powerful, one of the most lucrative businesses in American politics. And, and it, is, it, it shows in a, va- in a number of different ways. And a lot of times as the American people, we don't know who is in the ears of our politicians. We don't know who is in the ears of, of these polit- of political leadership, whether you're talking about local political leadership or national political leadership. Someone is there. Someone is there to try to get in the way of what the people want versus what a select few want. Someone is there to try to uh, uh, encourage or to try to convince political leadership what's in the best interest of the quote unquote, the American people. Uh, I wanted to bring this point up because as we talk about this next story of how former Vice President Mike Pence, who was the Vice President of Donald Trump, he has been lobbied, he was lobbied more than any other president in the past 24 years has been, he's been lobbied. And I thought that this was such a fascinating story, folks. So fascinating. So I wanted to discuss it and bring it to your attention to understand the power behind it. All right, first and foremost, let me just share with you why he was lobbied so much. Why? Because there were so many people that saw Mike Pence as really being, and now you may agree or disagree with this, but in the Trump administration, Mike Pence represented government stability. I'm going to say that once again. In the Trump administration, Mike Pence was seen as being the stable side of government. And as a result of his political experience being in Congress, being the, the uh, um, he served as the governor for the state of Indiana for one term, having that experience, they and, and him just knowing how government works, people and companies constantly went to Mike Pence, especially during the time that he served as the head of the COVID-19 task force there were so many companies that had lobbied Mike Pence from dealing with uh, uh, for pushing, you know, COVID-19 prior to the vaccination. And even after the vaccination started to get rolling, there were companies that were advocating, petitioning for Mike Pence to put his seal of approval to get the vice president to back whatever COVID-19 uh, remedy they may have. And that's just one of many elements of how much people had brought had, had come to former Vice President Mike Pence. I want to break this down to you. I want to share this just this uh, this piece of data with you, uh, Keen. If we could pull this up, looking at the numbers in terms of how Mike Pence was lobbied compared to any other Vice President, an average of two hundred seventy-seven special interests employed lobbyists to contact the vice president's office during each year of Pence's tenure, each year, compared with 132 requests during uh, during vice president Kamala Harris's first year in office. When Joe Biden was vice president, the number of clients averaged 83 requests per year. The average was 70 uh, clients per year when Dick Cheney held the office. So from the time of Dick Cheney to the time all the way up, look at how much that number has jumped. Check this out. In the first year of the Trump administration, this is according, this is all according to the nonprofit group called Open Secrets. You can go to their website, opensecrets.com. In the first year of the Trump administration, the number of lobbyists reporting a contact with the vice president's office increased 135% compared to compared with 43% for the executive office of the president, according to disclosure reports from Open Secret. 135%, folks, 
compared to 43%. So that means that more people went to Vice President Mike Pence than they actually did to Donald Trump. Mm, mm, mm. Mm, mm, mm. I want to bring in Culture Crew member uh, Iman Heath back into this conversation to get her take on this whole situation. Iman, this is this is eye-opening. This is fascinating. This is very fascinating. And again, I, my, my point in bringing this conversation to the forefront is to show people that, and I've heard this on local radio here in Baltimore, when we put, and I'm saying as black folks, when we put local, when we put political officials in office, something I heard Roland talk about, something I've heard other people talk about, we have been conditioned to just put people in office just based on good faith. Yep. Or similar. Just give them our vote and quote unquote our support. And through good faith, they will do the job of the people. Versus when these companies are looking at each candidate and compared them to their interests, they're not looking at the personality of the candidates. They're looking at what's good for my interest. And as a result of that, I'm going to, even though you might have a candidate that may not fall in full alignment with my interest, I'm going to convince them or sway them to come into alignment with my interest with all types of incentives. It could be money. It could be promises that we will make sure that you get reelected again. Mm-hmm. It can be, okay, we see that you have, uh, you trying to go forward on this area. Maybe we can help out with this area if you help us out in that area. I mean, it's that type of thing. But for us, and I'm saying for us as Black people, white people, Latinos, and Asian Americans, and all of those of us who are in this country, and we just think that voting enough is going to get, is going to move the needle on our interests and our, you know, our, our agenda. It's businesses, Wall Street. Hollywood and Mm. other institutions around this country, they know that the power comes with the dollar and they know that the power comes with the lobbyists. They know that. We just wish wish if it really would if it would click in our brains, and I'm gonna speak as far as African Americans with the work I've done, if we could just comprehend and click and get the message that if we hold our funds and put them where we are supported. We can get things moved and pushed, but we have to do our research, put the information out there as well, and hold our funds where we are supported. I wouldn't, as a as an African-American female, I wouldn't support a company or shop with a company who doesn't agree with, I'll, I'll say, uh, the, the, the SNAP benefits or the benefits of African-American children, something like that, right? I wouldn't shop with them or give them my support. So it's the same exact way when it comes to selecting local officials, any official. We have to look at what they support, um, what they support us with. Just because they look like us, sound like us, may have went to an HBCU, may have long, nice hair, or just because they feel familiar, get out the fields. Just because what they say sounds good, or just because they promise, for example. <laughs> forgiveness of student loan debt just is, because they're saying what we like or saying what feels good doesn't mean hey let's go let's go for that official no let's see what they're about let's see what they support i can completely understand why uh kamala harris isn't being as uh lobbied as much as pence was because she her work in her political history she was a prosecutor if i'm not coming to you with something other than maybe a criminal justice reform or criminal justice policy, or some type of cracking down the cold policy when it comes to um, the justice system, it doesn't seem as though you have the same interest or you'll most likely support my interest. You understand what I'm saying? Like, it No, doesn't... I understand what you're saying. But I think to, other, to her point, mm. the other part about why she may not be lobbied quite as much as Mike Pence is one, because people don't see her as being uh, politically qualified or competent to do the job. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. she's going to get lobbyists coming to her 
you know, the, uh, the, they're going to come to her because she's in the position. But that came to Mike Pence in particular because of his know-how, his yeah. qualification, right? His political qualification, his political experience. Correct. And people, quote unquote, if you're in the conservative space, you if you are part of the Republican network, people went to Mike Pence because they said, oh, OK, Donald Trump. He, he, you know what I mean? He a loose you cannon. Yeah, you, know, you can't talk to face. him. He a loose he cannon. But 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 Mike Pence, you could talk to him. And he that's what happened, not. right? Now, here's the thing. This is the other part about this, uh, what Open Secret shared in their disclosure reports. They had also showed that in the case of President Biden and Vice President Harris, more people would probably lobby President Biden because he's had that, that long-term political experience. Correct. I you know what I mean? I now for us, and I'm just say us as the constituents, as the 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 the, the, um, the citizens, one, we should know about that. We should know that people are working behind the scenes that's that literally folks, I'm just putting this picture out there for you. Imagine if you talk to your elected official, locally or national, and then you tell this elected official uh, hey, look, uh, we need to stop the violence in, in, in this area. Okay, no problem. But then you have the gun lobby that will come right behind you and say, look, um, we know that there's an issue with guns, but let me just tell you, guns protect people. And if you push for legislation to not get us off the streets, but really just to let people know, like, we'll start putting some, some guidelines on how you access guns. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the we'll guidelines, work with... The guidelines will be so slight. The right. Guidelines, the guidelines will be, instead of you having to be 18, you have, you now have to be 20. Like, 20. the guidelines make no significant difference at all. It just sounds good. And it'll be able to be a counterpoint as to why, you know, they wouldn't support what you're trying to lobby. But it, it's it's it just sounds good. It's all in the fields. That's it. That's what I'm saying. And so there has to be a strategy, Iman, I think for black people and for Latino, for the brown community in this country, and from those who have been often marginalized and disenfranchised, that we got to have some sort of acknowledgement and strategy that, okay, we know lobbyists are going to come. Let me just tell you, prime example. We had two big bills that this administration could not move forward. The mm -hmm. George Floyd Justice for Policing Act, right? And then I'm going to use this other one uh, dealing with uh, um, not the voting rights bill. What's the other one? It was the George Floyd. And it was, I'm going to share it with I'm just, it just crossed my mind, just lost the thought. But it, if you had that bill, if you looked at the Justice for Policing Act, why wasn't that bill passed? in light of all of this police brutality and issues. Well, the policy, the, 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 the lobby of the police department, the lobby of the police department, the FOP and other groups put the pressure on. That FOP, that FOP is, is, is something serious. They, they, they put the pressure the on, right? The famous terms is basically like the, the police, uh, the, the lawyers or, or the, the defender of police officers um yeah if you don't if you don't know what your at least local police off not police office police department is working on and what they're trying to push and trying to move i just want everybody to understand defunding the police does not mean that they're going to lose any money from their paycheck their hours will not be cut it does not mean less officers on the street it just means the funds will be allocated in different ways it does not mean they'll be punished or it, it, it doesn't make significant difference. It's just the money, different monies will be funded and going other places. So this, the fund the police thing, let's as a collective, let's remove that and, and, and take that out of our, our brains. No, it's I not, get that. It's not what we think it is. It's I get not that. not what you think it is. So, so and, and I'm just using that as an example that sometimes the policing lobby can be so strong, especially on a local or state level, right? It can be so strong that that we don't see any real reform in the police department, right? Correct. Or, or on a national level, the policy doesn't get passed through. Correct. We could talk about that in light of the voting rights situation, right? 
Like, like, like it just didn't get it. Just these things are not these are big bills that did not get passed by this administration so far. Now, does that mean that the administration can completely throw it out the window? No, not at all. But the fight is so prevalent and the likelihood that they're going to get passed if the Republicans take um, the take the Congress in November. I mean, it just it just makes that possibility Who's going to fund the push. Who's going to fund the fight? That's the that's, and that's, the, the, that's the other thing, right? Because see, yeah. the Amer again, as the American people, we have been conditioned to believe that just our vote in good faith in political leadership alone is going to bring the change that we yearn for, and that's not the that's not the case, folks. We have to do the legwork. We have that's to not the legwork. case. You, you, you got to do it. everybody. Look, Iman, everybody uses this term. We got to hold these people accountable. How? Okay. How are you going to do that? Exactly. And 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 when when you say hold them accountable, if you're not and I'm and I'm not saying that you got to do something nefarious like you know telling them to 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 cheat people, but you're not putting money in their pocket. You're not you're we, not you're we, not we you're not even doing. Take the, take the step to even pick up the phone and say, "Hey, I'm." A, they're not thinking about us. Officer, yeah, yeah. They're not thinking about us because why? We're not putting money in their pocket. We're not creating a tangible benefit. And I'm so sorry to say that. I really am because we were always taught to believe that that the government of this United States works on the good moral mm -hmm. uh, uh, and behavior, or they work on what's so-called, quote unquote, what's right for the American people. And they that's not the case. Us. That is not the case. And I was- That's not the case. You got to- Back as uh as far as benefits, any type of benefits, any government stipend, section eight, uh anything the government may be giving us for free, it started I believe as far as African Americans and our mentality, the government will take care of us. The government removed the man, removed the man from the household, then let's throw drugs in there, let's throw this gun violence in there, let's throw some more sprinkle some more poverty in there, and it became a I think mentality that the government will take care of us. I get, I can buy food. I won't starve. I get free government, free uh, food stamps from the government. Oh, I can, I can afford to have this car and have this and have that because the government gives me free money. Oh, my rent is forty five dollars a month because the government gives me, gives me a stipend. Like we have become so independent on the government that I believe that helps build our faith. Oh no, the government will take care of it. Let's vote him or this person or that person. But they, it, it feels good. They say they're going to support me or they'll give us huh, they'll give us another stimulus check. Let's support them. The government's going to take care of us. We got to get out that mindset. We yeah. have to get out of it. Why are they always parked outside the projects? Right. Make it make sense. Right. But the government will take care of us. And I'm not saying everyone who, who does get us assistance doesn't actually need it because I know there are there are some who do. And that's fine. But we have to get out of this mindset of I'm going to stay right here where I'm comfortable at and the government take care of the rest. No, we have to get our monies together as a collective to so have some type of power. We can't come to the table or have a seat at the table. We have to create our seat. We don't have one. We don't as have one. We don't have one because one, we can't keep our money in our pocket to boycott. That's number. We can't boycott for one day. If we boycott it for one day, the difference we will make as far as the econ economy will be tremendous. That's a whole other topic. That's a but, whole other topic. Whole other That's topic. another whole other topic. But to, topic. as we wrap up this part of the discussion, it goes back to the fact of understanding this. Folks, I'm telling you, this is a fascinating, uh, um, you know, if you get a chance to check, take, take a look at this, um, and it's just a fascinating topic of, how money works in this country to influence public policy. And, and it, it, it's almost, I feel insulted. And I'm not saying that this is the, 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 the order of the day for every government official, but it is absolutely insulting to get the American people to believe that one form of participation is going to get them what they want, when in fact, that's the lowest form of participation. To go to the ballot box is is just part of part of the democratic system or the republic that we're a part of. But at the end of the day, the real power is those having 
the resources, whether it's the financial resources or other resources, and the level of accountability that they can place on government officials to get that government official, that political leader, to do what they want them to do. They're working for these lobbyists in a lot of ways. So Mike Pence is getting all these requests. Now, whether how he de dealt with the requests, how he engaged with these individuals and these companies, we don't know. But it's just the fact that in a time of crisis or in a time of upheaval and uncertainty, like we saw with the Trump administration for four years, that he was the go-to guy. And they worked to build relationships with him. Mm. And then the same thing, every time a new administration, whether you're talking about on a federal level or on a local level, every time a new administration come in, there are people that watch the administration that know the weaknesses and the strengths of the administration, who's actually making the decisions, who is mm -hmm. being used as just the, the face of the administration, all of those things. They understand the dynamics of power and for marginalized and oppressed people in this country, we got to do the same thing. We have I to start say this really, really quickly for Roger, but for, yeah. for, for my, my minorities who may not understand exactly what we're saying, think of Tyler Perry's um, series, The Haves and the Have Nots. That is a perfect example of what we mean when if you have this type of money behind you, there are a lot of things that you can get done. So if you don't understand how the politics works as far as lobbying, Look at Tyler Perry's The Have and the, the Haves and the Have Nots. That helps yeah. you explain exactly what we're saying. Great point. Great point. Folks, we got to take a quick pause. When we come back, let's shift gears. Let's talk about policing in this country. We're going to be joined by a uh, former FBI agent and consultant, Dr. Tyrone Powers, to give us some insight about what we're seeing with this case of Patrick Lyoya in Michigan. And do we need to rethink how uh, traffic stops are done? We'll have that conversation up next. So stay with us. It's the culture here on the Black Star Network. Don't you think it's time to get wealthy? I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show on the Black Star Network focuses on the things your financial advisor or bank isn't telling you. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. Hi, I'm Dr. Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We'll laugh together, cry together, pull ourselves together, and cheer each other on. So join me for new shows each Tuesday on Black Star Network, a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. Pull up a chair, take your seat, the Black Tape, with me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network. Every week, we'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. Folks, welcome back to the second hour of today's show here on the Culture on the Black Star Network. So happy for us for you to join us. Um, we wanted to have a we want to have a conversation about policing in this country, especially in light of one of the more graphic um, police situations that we've seen over these past couple of months. And I'm speaking of the case of Patrick Lyoya. This is the 26 year old who was uh, shot fatally in the head by a Michigan police and in, in the quiet suburbs of Grand Rapids, Michigan. Now, Patrick's case has gone worldwide and has become a viral sensation. And more importantly, it has got brought people from across the country to go hit the streets and to protest police reform. Now, as of right now, um, evidence is still being gathered. 
But one of the things that has been missing from this case, along with the fact that you have body cam footage of what has happened to Patrick um, from various angles, whether it's from the body cam of the officer responsible for the killing of Patrick, whether it's the camera coming from homes where people have ring lights on their homes or the dash camera, uh, one thing is clear that police brutality in this country has not stopped and has not stopped happening um, even though George Floyd was killed just two years ago. There has not been any major reckoning of, of race nor of race and policing since George Floyd has been killed. Unfortunately, going back to what is happening on a national front, there has not been any real reform of policing since George Floyd was killed. Well, one of the new ideas that has been uh, that has been discussed is this idea of us rethinking traffic stops. There have been calls for, for there to be uh, training. There have been calls for uh, police officers to do some implicit bias testing. Now the question is, could rethinking US police traffic stops save lives? And we wanted to bring in an expert to give us some insight on this whole case of Patrick Lyoya, as well as um, you know this idea of rethinking traffic stops he used to be a former FBI agent. He's an author, and he is the founder of the uh, Powers Consulting Group. We want to welcome to the airwaves of the Black Star Network here on The Culture, Dr. Tyrone Powers. Dr. Powers, thank you so thank much, you dear so brother, much for brother, for being a part of the, part of the conversation. conversation. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. It's a privilege and an honor to be with you and to discuss this uh, this very important subject. Um, it's, it's, it's significant. One of the things I wanted to start with, if you don't mind, Faraji, because sure, sure. as we talk about policing and the history of policing, the, the legislation and reform bills are major. We need to change um, policing, no doubt about it. But the history of policing dictates that the way you change policing in your community is to police your own communities. For example, the Irish who believed at one point whether it was their perception or the reality that they were being oppressed and abused and brutalized by police, made a conscious effort and made a strategic decision to become the police. Mm. And then in the early 1920s, they decided that they were going to groom their young people to protect their own community because no matter how much legislation they put in place, no matter how much they protest, no matter how many wrongs they pointed out, they were not going to change the mentality of the people going into policing because they were socialized. Then they became police in the academy. And then they saw themselves um, not too distant from the patty rollers. They saw themselves as patrollers and controllers, almost a mercenary force in the communities in which they police. So what the Irish did was groom young people in their community to become the police. They recruited them not by telling them about the nobility of the field. They said, do you not want to protect your mother? Do you not want to protect your family? Do you not want your grandmother not to be raped, robbed or murdered? Then here's an opportunity to make a living and to make a life and become your own protection because you're not going to change the mentality of others with lawsuits, with reform measures, with training because this is a mindset of policing in general from mm. uh, uh, in this particular country. The whole concept, the term paddy wagon, which is it come, it's an Irish term because what the Irish did was decide that if we become the police, we can make sure that our people are not disenfranchised. So if they get into minor violations, we can go pick them up in this wagon and drop them off at home, have a conversation with their parents, because if we arrest them, they're going to have arrest record records that's going to keep them from getting employment opportunities. And if they decide at some point to become a part of the federal apparatus, it's going to keep them from getting any kind of security clearances. So they would pick them up and take them home for minor violations. For major violations, they would make arrests. But they had the discretion, the power, and the decision, and they weren't asking others to treat them better. They be came the people doing the treatment. Um, in this city, in Baltimore City, uh, from where I live, um, former Mayor Kathy Pugh had brought me in. She said, Tyrone, we have to develop. We, I talked to her about this, an organic policing model. I said, we can begin to groom young people from a very young age to begin to police their own communities. You have to remember, in cities like Baltimore and others, Black police officers was brought in for one purpose, and that was to police Black communities. They couldn't even arrest whites 
in the night until the 1960s a black officer couldn't even arrest a white person they could mm. only put protect and serve the black community, which was kind of a noble mission. If whites weren't mailing attacks in black community, it was a noble mission because now you knew you were going to be treated right because when grandma saw the police, it was her grandson. When you saw the police, it was your brother. It was someone you went to school with. And though they were not going to allow you to get away with behavior that devastated the community, at the very least, they were not going to devastate you because they knew you. We keep asking others to police us better when we produce children every single year. And in every other country and every other community in the world, the way people people get proper policing is to police themselves. Whether you're in Saudi Arabia, whether you're in Israel, whether you're in uh, um, any kind of Palestine, the way you, the Palestinians are not going to let the Israelis police them. And the Israelis are not going to let Palestinians police them. And Japan, they're not going to let Chinese release um, police them. And then Japan, they're not going to let that no other group are going to say, you've got to police us better. You got to treat us better. We're going to create legislation for you to properly deal with us. Instead, they say, you know what? What if we actually police ourselves? What if we become the police? We can have a salary, have a living and a life and provide the protection in our community. It's an economic development plan as well as a protection plan. Mm. I do to continuously push for justice in our community. I do think the legislation and the reform measures are extremely important, but ultimately it's the mindset. So when you have a traffic, traffic stops can be dangerous for police officers because it's the unknown. You could actually be stopping someone for a traffic violation that had just robbed the bank or had been involved in a domestic violence situation. You can stop someone who may have 100 kilos of black tar heroin in the trunk, you may be stopping them for a traffic violation. So there is the unknown factor. And there's nothing wrong with police officers being careful. But what we saw in Michigan, and I used to live there. Remember, I was a police officer before I was a special agent with the FBI. And I spent part of my you know, career as a special agent with the FBI in Michigan, working in those offices and doing civil rights cases, investigating police corruption and police brutality and excessive force. And as you know now, that's what I do. I testify as an expert witness in these use of force, excessive force cases. And I also review um, use of force cases, even if police officers did things right. I'm contracted with Prince George's County State's Attorney's Office to review all of their policing cases. To, to determine whether it's right or wrong, but it's the mindset. So if you have a traffic stop, like the one we witnessed, and the individual, for whatever reason, um, doesn't want to cooperate, this is not a deadly force situation. A deadly force situation by law or by the Supreme Court in O'Connor versus Grandma, when you believe that the person who you are making an arrest or the person who you've decided you're going to arrest is proposes an imminent threat to you, of death or serious bodily harm to you or to someone else. Clearly, that is not the case in this particular situation. It'll be interesting to see whenever the police is interviewed, when the police reports come out, when the discovery process is done, what the officer says his reason for this action will. He could say that he made a mistake. It was he fired the firearm by mistake, but then he would have to explain taking out on in the first place because you would have to prove that your life was under threat of imminent, of, of serious bodily harm or, or death before mm -hmm. you even read the weapon from your holster. And if they come back and say, well, we did it because he was taking my taser away. Well, you had already fired the taser and you can't fire the taser again until a cartridge is reloaded unless you dry fire a taser. Then you would have to be an expert in tasers. So you would have to believe that the victim in this case was an expert in tasers. So because he can't redeploy the taser at that particular point because you've already deployed it. So even if he takes it from you, even if he has it in his possession, your argument can't be that I thought at that time that he was going to tase me, which would have incapacitated me, which is why I drew my weapon, because you know for a fact, if you know how to taser work, that you would have to reload the taser. And he also know that because you can't have a taser without having taser training. But it's the mentality. It's it, the traffic stops. It's not the traffic stop, it's the mentality of the officers. It's not the operation, it's the mentality of the officers. And the training, the sensitivity training, the implicit bias training, all of that is good. But I can tell you this, when officers use excessive force, when they, when they decide and make a conscious decision to use more force than is necessary in any particular situation, and you know the continuum of force go from mere presence to deadly force, 
that is a mentality issue, not the issue of the tactic of making traffic stops, not the issue of the mental of the tactic of, of of conducting a legal search, but they have made a decision that despite all these prohibitions, they're going to do it in a different way. And they've made some conscious decision based on socialization even before they got to the police department, which is not socialized out doing the training in the police department to take these particular actions is certainly against a group of people who they have, have been demonized. Mm. When I was in, yeah, I think I mentioned to you this one time before when I was on with you and I testified before Congress with Maxine Waters about this, that a document came across my desk because when we go out to interview people in the different communities, they give us an analysis of how to interview these particular communities, whether they're black or the culture or ethnic group is different. And the one for African-Americans said that African-Americans are extremely emotional, but they're not very intellectual. In other words, they won't use the scientific method. They won't have a hypothesis and take it to a logical conclusion. So they're going to have protests. They're going to argue. They're going to yell. But they're not going to have a concrete strategy that would actually bring this to a logical conclusion. Now, I don't believe that, but I'm just telling you, and I've said over and over again, the documents. So when they come out to interview you, Faraji, if you yell and scream, they've been trained to let you yell and scream. If you get upset, if you want to hold protests in the street, if you want to have protests about Trayvon Martin like they did in Florida, if after all that's said and done, the stay in the ground law is still in place, then they believe it proves their theory that they've come up with the from the behavioral science unit that we are emotional, that we'll get upset, that we'll have a protest. But in the end, after all is said and done, we'll be right back where we are. Mm. When you start discussing this, when we started this conversation, you said that post George Floyd, things have not changed. Well, there's an anticipation that we will be angry about George Floyd, that maybe there will be a conviction that people, some people will go to jail, but the mentality won't change. The only way that you can properly in the long term ensure that your communities are properly policed is to become the police. And what they've done is made us so opposed to police, so opposed to the ideal of policing that we cut up our nose to spite our face. The reality of the matter is black people have never not wanted to be protect and serve. That is not the issue. In fact, up until the 1960s, because remember, policing was called policing up until the 1960s and the 1950s when you had the civil rights movement in the anti-war protests for the Vietnam War and so on and so forth. Then policing even changed their name to law enforcement. Now, policing means to serve and protect. Law enforcement, in the very word, says that we're going to use force to make you follow the law. In fact, at that time, they brought up shows like Dragnet, where he just said nothing but the facts. I don't want to hear anything else. We're just going to use force to make you follow the law. So this law enforcement mentality, not policing, not to protect and serve, is a mentality in many of our communities that have that 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 allows police officers to have a mentality to put, have them put certain tactics in place. And no matter what legislation that we put in place, they're always, we're always going to have these kind of incidents because the, the, the police have known, even without the new reform legislation, that it's wrong to use excessive force. The use of force continuum have existed for a very long time, long time from their presence to um, deadly force, justifying the amount of force you use on an individual, only using the force that will allow you to effect a legal arrest. All of that has been in the books and the policies for a very long time. It's the mentality. And not yeah. only the mentality of the officers who exercise that force, but first line supervisors. I've said this over and over again. I had a supervisor in the police department that every night when I went out, he said, don't go out and get me in trouble. So if first line supervisors understood that if police officers under their supervision, if they did something wrong, then the first line supervisor was also going to be held accountable for that. Because we always talk about the individual who took the action. We don't talk about the individual who was the sergeant who was supervising the people who are on the street that night. And why is his or her people out of control? Why are they willing to take on these kind of actions? Why in the George Floyd case, that the officer in that case felt comfortable doing that, putting his knee on George Floyd's neck for so long because he knew that even if my supervisor come, he's not going to oppose this action. So it's not only the officer, it's That's the cult, it's the mentality, it's the thought that we can get away with this despite whatever rules or regulations or reform measures you put in place. The Irish understood that. 
And then they said, well, we're going to become the police. So in Baltimore, you have NARS. Go across the country. You will notice that police chiefs have Irish names. You will notice that they control. They made a conscious decision to control politics and policing. Policing so that our people won't be disenfranchised, won't be abused, and won't be brutalized. And politics so we decide who get the money. We had O'Malley and NARS. The first thing O'Malley did when he became mayor of Baltimore was go get an Irish police commissioner. And Edward NARS, look across the country. Look at the history of that across the country. And they made a strategic conscious decision is we're not going to ask people to better police us. We're going to police ourselves. Mm. Uh, Doc, you brought up so many important points up on this. as and, and, and I think that's, you know, when you talk about whether these traffic stops can be reimagined, can they be rethought, can they be done differently? Um, and listening to the history and the context of it, it, it seems like, it can be done, but it's not the will of the powers that be, that be to have it done. That that for well, us, we're in a situation, Dr. Powers, where it's like we, we have to start to take matters into our own hands. And I'm not talking about vi with violence. I'm talking about getting more involved. One of the big pieces that is the things that you just said, which I think is a great idea, actually, is to get more young people to get to, uh, to to create a pathway for young people to become a part of the police department in the local the police department, whether you're in Baltimore or whatever city, and right. I think that's a great idea. But the 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 big piece of when you say it, it's the mentality, one of our watchers they said it, and I think this is this this is the key in on exactly what you're saying. Melvin Wright said, "You cannot legislate what's in the heart." Now. I agree with that. Melvin, I agree with you on that, brother. But the crazy part is you can't legislate what's in the heart, but it's out of the heart and the mind that certain policies come into existence. Yeah, you know, Dr. King said when they asked him, was he trying to get white people to love him? He said, no, I'm not trying to get them to love me. I'm just trying to keep them from lynching me. He said, only God can change a man's heart. I'm not trying to do that. I don't see myself as God. I'm trying to put things in place to put protect our people from being lynched, abused, discriminated against, all those other things that are in place. See, I think what we've done, and Faraji, we've had this discussion before, the answers to many of our issues are with our ancestors. We just don't read. I remember going into the office of an individual at a university in which I was speaking. I, was, I, I didn't even name it. It was DePaul University in Chicago. And he was saying, we've got to come up with some new solutions. And he had this whole library of books behind him. I said, brother, Every, we already have the solutions. What we do is don't read and implement. These people who wrote these books, whether it was Marcus Garvey or Dr. Carter G. Woodson or Shirley Chisholm, or all these people who did this work or Fannie Lou Hammer, these people left us a blueprint for work, not necessarily words, but work. And we keep thinking that we have to reinvent, reimagine, restructure. And they say, this is how you get this done. But we read all these for the beauty of knowledge, but we don't have the burden of knowledge to implement what they already gave us and what they already put, put in place. When I talk about um, um, traffic stops, for example, we know that some text, some traffic stops are pretext stops. Sure, nobody cares about whether your tag light is out. The police officer just want a reason to stop you. If you had the appropriate supervision, if you had a uh, a person of color and conscious in those positions, not just of color, but of color and conscious in those positions, they could mm. tell the officers to go before they go out. We are making stops only based on probable cause. And if that line is crossed, there will be consequences and repercussions. Again, that's what the Irish did. And they did it for, again, a number of reasons to keep these minor arrests, this mass incarceration thing from occurring because they did it for a reason. I told you when I was with the police department, if I stopped some young people for a violation and I smell at the time when marijuana was illegal in every state and I smell marijuana, I would just take it and throw it away. I'm not going to make an arrest for you for this and, and package you for this because I know for a fact that all this can do is disenfranchise you. It's not going to make the mm. community safer. 
by taking on this particular action. If you have police officers of conscience, they can take those actions, have that conversation with those young people. And those young people from that point on, whenever they saw me, they had a relationship with me because they know the outcome of that situation, even though it was the constitutional and based on probable cause, could have been very different had I not handled it different, had they not a person in a position in that position. In fact, I can tell you on a number of occasions when I stopped people and then I stopped one time a, a, a vehicle full of sorority sisters and soon I approached the car, they said, brother, we know this going to go right. And we don't know what's going to happen. We know we were wrong. We were doing something wrong, but right. we know this going to go right. And it did go right. So what I'm saying, the Irish had that mentality. That so, so, so fact, Dr. Powers, when we look at these cases, when we look at the case of Patrick um, when we look at the case of, um, and I'm just saying the, just the cases of traffic stops like Patrick, Sandra Bland, Walter Scott, like we, we, we see these cases, we hear these outcomes. What, what, what needs to be done at this point? What needs to be you done? Know, do we need to really, do, 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 do officers need to go back to the lab and figure out a better way to do traffic stops? You yeah. talked about mentality. I mean, it seems like there's a huge disparity between what's the reality and then what we what we what we're talking about, what we're theorizing, what we're what we're hoping. So what needs yeah. to be done? Because I want to see. And this is one of the other parts of the Patrick's case. They're not releasing the name of the officer who responsible for killing Patrick Iolia. Yeah. That, and, and, and as a result of that, that leads to more distrust. Yes, the legislation peace, the peace that we were talking about when you talk about police reform, how quickly that information needs to be released, how quickly um, um, details need to be released, and how quickly the investigations need to be done thoroughly, completely constitutionally, but how thoroughly they need to be done. I always am concerned, to be honest with you, Faraji, when we talked about police needing more training, they need more supervision, more consequences and repercussions for when they do things wrong. Police officers know who go through an academy, the normal academy in this particular country, that they're not supposed to use excessive force and brutality. I don't have to retrain you not to beat somebody up who's already in handcuffs. I don't mm. have to retrain you they not to shoot somebody in the back of the head. I don't have to retrain you on those things. You know that. In fact, some of that is common knowledge even before you go through police training. The limitations of your power that you are still restricted and, and contained or restrained within the law. I don't have to retrain you on that, but there have to be consequences for your particular actions. And they have to be supervision held accountable for the actions of the officers that are under them, because then they would make sure, even if I'm a racist sergeant, if I know that if the people under me, if they do something wrong tonight, I'm going to lose my pension, my job, and I could possibly be a part of the indictment because I was supposed to be supervising the behavior of this officer who technically have already been properly trained because whatever certifying agency is in that state in Maryland is the Maryland Police and Corrections Training Commission have said they are properly trained. If I start my legal um, process by saying that not only do I want to name, now we don't know whether there'll be convictions of the sergeant or not, but even if the sergeant or the supervisor know that if the people you are supervising do something wrong, if they go out and do something inconsistent with what they're supposed to do, that you two are going to be caught up in that, then they will have a motivation. See, not only the, the righteousness and the nobility doesn't always motivate people, but mm. Consequences and repercussions really do. And those police officers, those officers who are saying that, well, the field of policing, I did a presentation to police officers in Philadelphia. Those officers who are saying, oh, the field of policing, I don't see, this is why people are not in the field. I want to get out. You know, police officers are not going anywhere. They just are saying they need to keep their pension. They like the job they're in. All you are telling them is to do it the right way. Do it the constitutional way and don't use excessive force and brutality. Don't prejudge people or use bias to people based on the color of their skin, gender, ethnicity, and things of that sort. Mm -hmm. They're not going anywhere, but they have to be held accountable and they have to be held accountable immediately. So all the legislation that we put in place, 
all the reform that we put in place have to carry it with it some sanctions not only for the individual who carries out the transgression but the people who are supposed to make sure that they and i don't mean the police departments and lawsuits having to pay out money i mean the people who are supposed to supervise them as i said my supervisor in policing was very clear on that because he never told me not to go out and get in trouble he told me don't go out and get him in trouble that was my mission for the night. And I understood that clear because I wasn't going to get in trouble. But he's saying that whatever you do is a reflection of me because I spoke to you at roll call. I'm the one on the street supervising your behavior. I'm the one who they put in charge of this group of particular officers. That had to be part of the reform, part of the legislation, part of the conversation. Who was the um, officer Chauvin's who, the, who killed George Floyd, who was his supervisor? Mm. Why don't we know? I know the police yeah. department came on, so we didn't train them to do that. Who I want to see the face of that supervisor, because what about all the other officers that was on patrol, not the ones just were charged in this particular case, but all the other officers that was under his or her um, control on that particular night. In the meantime, I'm not saying we shouldn't push for reform, that we need to change legislation. But all these things are not mutually exclusive. And we do have to see these things due to their logical conclusion. And their logical conclusion is not the conviction and imprisonment of one officer, because it's a systemic problem. It's a mentality. So even if the officers in the George Floyd case are completely convicted, that won't change the mentality of the department. And we will be addressing this again years later. Think about this. When a civil lawsuit is filed against the police department, the very people who pay for that lawsuit are the taxpayers. So the very people who are being brutalized are actually paying the settlement to the family who was brutalized. So it's not the, the police department. When you sue a police department, they're paying, they're paying off that lawsuit with taxpayers' money. So I'm protesting and I'm also paying the settlement for the behavior of the officers who participated mm -hmm. in this. So they don't have it. There's no great incentive, even in mm -hmm. civil cases, there's no great incentive. Not not to continue this behavior or not to have this mentality. There has to be other consequences. And I'm telling you, first line supervisors, no matter what their mentality is, will get those under them to operate in a certain way because of consequences, not because you're going to change their feeling towards black people. There's no divine intervention action at all of them, something all of a sudden going to say, love all black people, police the black community in a certain way, there's going to have to be consequences and repercussions. Dr. King said that. I'm not trying to make them love me. Only God can change a man's heart. I'm trying to keep them from lynching me. And there's and all our strategies have to be designed at that. Have to be designed. And then we have to see them through to a logical conclusion, yeah. not like the FBI profile of Black people, our protests, our sermons, our orientation, our speeches, and our being satisfied when one or two officers go to prison for the violation, but not going after the individuals who allowed this individual to go on the street every single night and was supposed to be supervising them and made them feel comfortable in doing and in, in carrying out this kind of behavior. Absolutely. Dr. Tyrone Powers, Director of Innovation and Special Initiatives at Anne Arundel Community College. He's an author um, and he is also a consultant doing work within the law enforcement community. Dr. Powers, we certainly got to bring you back on, dear brother. But I mean, you, you gave us so much to think about, um, especially looking at the in, in light of Patrick's case and just all of these cases. Like there, 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 there has to be some new conversations happening in this country around policing. And the history that you provided us today, I think is a great start looking at what the Irish did and then also looking at how we employ some of the strategies that made that their level of policing successful within their community to look at how we can do it in our own community because we're at i feel like we're at a tipping point doc and i know you see it and everybody else in this country is seeing it we're at a tipping point either something is going to be done or we're going to see some level of rebellion some level of re revolution in the streets around the we situation we saw that during the 1960s the current commission dealt with that I don't know if we're at a tipping point. I think we should be at a point where we are developing concrete strategies because even if we have the rebellions, and I'm not saying rebellions are sometimes necessary. We saw that with the Freddie Gray case, but we're still seeing issues with the police department here and in other cities in St. Louis and other places. I've seen the tipping point. I've seen us get there before emotionally, but I think we need to get there intellectually 
intellectually and strategically so we can have permanent change, not episodic change, and not episodic emotional change, but some permanent strategic change. Yeah. And I think we're fully capable of that. Absolutely, absolutely. Dr. Tyrone Powers checking in. Dr. Powers, thank you so much for your time today, thank brother. We you. truly appreciate thank it. Take absolutely. care. Absolutely. Uh, folks, we're going to take a quick pause. When we come back, more conversation. Stay with us. It's the culture here on the Black Star Network. Pull up a chair. Take your seat. The Black Tape with me, Dr. Greg Carr, here on the Black Star Network every week. We'll take a deeper dive into the world we're living in. Join the conversation only on the Black Star Network. Don't you think it's time to get wealthy? I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show on the Black Star Network focuses on the things your financial advisor or bank isn't telling you. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. Hi, I'm Dr. Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We'll laugh together, cry together, pull ourselves together, and cheer each other on. So join me for new shows each Tuesday on Black Star Network, a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. It's time to be smart. Roland Martin's doing this every day. Oh, no punches! Thank you, Roland Martin, for always giving voice to the issues. Look for Roland Martin in the whirlwind, to quote Marcus Garvey again. The video looks phenomenal, so I'm really excited to see it on my big screen. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. See, this is the difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. I got to defer to the brilliance of Dr. Carr and to the brilliance of the Black Star Network. I am rolling with rolling all the way. Honored to be on a show that you own. A black man <laughs> owns the show. Folks, Black Star Network is here. I'm real uh, revolutionary right now. Wow. Rolling was amazing on that. Stay black. I love y'all. I can't commend you enough about this platform that you've created for us to be able to share who we are, what we're doing in the world, and the impact that we're having. Let's be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You can't be black on media and be scared. You dig? It's time to be smart. When we control our institutions, we win. We win. This is the most important news show on television of any racial background. Y'all put two, three, four, five, 10, 15, 20, 30 dollars on this and keep this going. What you've done, Roland, since this crisis came out in full bloom. Anybody watching this, tell your friends, go back and look at the last two weeks, especially of Roland Martin Unfiltered. I mean, hell, go back and look at the last two days. You've had sitting United States senators today, Klobuchar and Harris. Whatever you have that you have, you can bring to Roland Martin Unfiltered to support it. Please do, because this information may literally save your life. Watch Roland Martin Unfiltered daily at 6 p.m. Eastern on YouTube, Facebook, or Periscope, or go to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Support the Roland Martin Unfiltered Daily Digital Show by going to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. All right, folks, welcome back to the show. Um, we just had a um, some enlightening conversation with Dr. Tyrone Powers, a former FBI agent, about policing and law enforcement in this country. And Dr. Powers dropped so many jewels that I wanted to, to bring in uh, culture crew member Iman Heath um, back into the discussion to you know give us her insight as to what she heard uh, from Dr. Powers. Iman, um, you know, th there was a lot to take in on that 
on that segment, right? Which I'm very, very grateful that we had a chance to hear directly from Dr. Powers, who is a man who's been doing law enforcement work for years. And, you know, he he advises, you know, as he said, you know, mayors and other individuals about law enforcement and, and look at cases. But when we look at the, the depth of, of how, uh, of this issue, right? Of not just policing in the black community or policing around the country. When we look at how policing started with the Irish community and then how it just constantly evolved. And then, you know, I didn't know, for example, the history that black people really couldn't lock up white people for a while. I mean, all of these different iterations of what has happened in policing in this country has finally brought us to this point. And now I know for me, I can start to see clearly, oh, there has been some very, uh, uh, there's been some real issues with policing so, from the beginning. Yeah, the, the history, just even how just police policing started, um, even take it back to slavery, slavery, you know, during slavery, they were a group that started to round up runaway slaves or catch runaway, runaway slaves or go to the homes of those people who were free, who were hiding slaves in their homes. So that's essentially where policing started. Mm -hmm. Those, those five-star Those badges. overseers. Yes, overseers. There we go. Overseers. That's where it started. Then they started the badges and they um, were the uh, policing cow cowboys. Um, the history is the part I think a lot of us are missing. What was the point of police and why were they created? Like Dr. Uh, Powell said, we don't read. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. Open a book, take your head out of Instagram and read. I remember in college, um, I learned about the, the bus boycott and just, I mean, I, I'd already knew about it, but just the details behind it. They planned that bus boycott for months. They were calling each other, sending letters, sending um, newsletters. It it wasn't just an inst instantaneous thing or I just woke up one day and we're going to do this. It was planned. It was organized. It was a strategy that was very effective. And everybody was a part of it collectively. If we just look at our history of actually getting things done, that's where we can start at. We don't have to start with, we have to rethink, okay, well, how can we get them to change change their mind? They're absolutely, Dr. Powell is absolutely right. You cannot change their mindset. We cannot change their heart. I cannot convince you that my black skin is no threat to you. I can't convince you of that. If you have that fear or I intimidate you, there's nothing I can do about that. I cannot help that. However, what we need to do is create consequences and create uh, reactions other than riots and burning buildings down to police brutality, to but to keep being quiet or we'll be angry and upset and protest and, and, and riot, then it dies back down. We have to keep that fuel going. But again, because it doesn't hit home, because not something we're constantly seeing, we're okay, we're fine, we're, we, we, we'll be okay. If you give us the promise that you'll convict the officer, give us the promise that they'll lose their job, we'll be okay. No, to hell with the pacifiers. To take, take the pacifiers, burn the pacifiers. Be done with that. But we have to take action. We can't keep crying and praying and wishing for you, for for a change. We have to do the legwork. I'm yeah. tired. Yeah. I'm tired. No, I mean, let me tell you, you ain't you ain't the only one tired. Oh, you I'm ain't the only one tired. You and I, tired. look, look, look. I know work. No, let me tell you, this situation that we're seeing uh, and that we're a part of, Iman, um, in terms of the police department, this is it's it's so bad. It's so bad because it's like you trying to push a rock up a hill, and then the rock comes back down and falls on it's you. A muddy hill. It's a, a muddy hill, muddy right? Hill. And the rock falls back down on you, and then you start thinking to yourself, "Well, this rock will never get up there." But then is people along the way with muddy hands are telling you, "No, we can make it." We can do it. We'll help you. But you got muddy hands. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, like the stuff that we're doing right now, 
and I'm just reflecting on what Dr. Powers just said. The stuff that we're doing right now don't speak to the mentality. It don't speak to the mentality of officers. I mean, here's a former police officer and saying it's not even about training. You don't have to train somebody. You shouldn't have to train someone to not bust you in the head. That doesn't make sense. Like, like that person doesn't know they shouldn't bust you in the head. Like, it, it, you know, it's you shouldn't have to train someone. In the case of Patrick, the officer, what is he going to say? He was literally on top of Patrick. Patrick's face was, was face down into the ground, grabbing his taser. He just grabbing stuff. The officer don't use, you know, deploys the taser and then decides to use the gun execution style and shoots him in the head. What, what do you say to that? And then the, and then the police department, I'm going to say it again. The police department said they weren't going to release the name. Body cam, dash cam. All of these cams are watching this whole situation or recording this whole situation play out. As an officer, you could not possibly say that your life was in danger if you're sitting on top of another man and he's face down in the ground. Uh, I tried Going back to, to Dr. Control. Powell's point. Going back to his point. It's not even enough to get a conviction. Because, like he said, Somewhere along the line, the police officers, whether you're talking about this one, you're talking about Derek Chauvin, you're talking about any officer that killed one of our people, somewhere along the line, they were told or they were encouraged or they often, whatever tactics that they used, did not, was not interrupted. Those tactics were like, oh, okay, you got to do what you got to do to make the person listen to you. I try to so get a do sense that. of uh, being angry and upset. Uh, we do we Iman, you still with us? Okay, looks like we may have lost. Her. Hopefully, she jumps right back in, folks. Let me just say that. Let me just say that that that, that what we're talking about is, and and I'm and I'm glad Dr. Powell said because I always thought about this. And I'm like, why aren't we looking at the sergeants? Why aren't we looking at the people that are overseeing these officers? Why aren't they getting fired? I mean, why why aren't they being penalized? Why wh why does it have to be someone loses their life and then everybody starts start, starts talking about tactics and strategies and I mean, why? Let me just share with you what folks are saying. And folks, you can continue to post your thoughts and we're going to get Iman right back. But folks are just look, have been listening to what Dr. Powers is saying. Let me just share it. Uh, we got so many people that came in on the chat. I'm just going back and taking a... Melvin said, as far as the Irish is concerned, the once oppressed eventually becomes the oppressor. The mentality of the oppressor overtakes the mentality of the once oppressed. We are dealing with the aftermath. We are definitely dealing with the aftermath. We are dealing with the aftermath. We have never been in a situation, folks, I want you to hear me very loud and clear. We have never been in a situation, Black people in this country, we have never been in a situation where we felt that our life was being protected every day. Can you imagine that? And I'm talking to people that are not a part of the black community. Can you imagine waking up every single day feeling like you may lose your life? And I'm not talking about some, some, some stuff like, oh, off in the ether. As a black man, I'm speaking of myself, as a black man, I have to walk outside of those doors and I actually have to entertain the idea that because of my skin color, that my life can be taken from me. 
It crosses my mind when I see the police. It crosses my mind when I see my own people. That my life can be taken. That's how deep this situation runs. And it, it is such a, a psychological break that when the people that we are supposed to look to to protect and serve us, when they are serving as the source of our pain, that is a psychological disruption. It's like a child that's been abused by their parents. And I'm just using this. The child is thinking that the parent is there to protect them from abuse. But if the protector becomes the source of the abuse, that's a hard, hard pill to swallow, man. And that's where we are in this country. We want to hope and believe that police, and they, they should, right? I mean, of course, they, we know that there are some great officers. We know all of that. But I'm saying that even, I'm saying as an institution, we still don't have 100% faith in the institution that they're going to think about preserving our lives. We don't have that here. We don't have it. We have to think about that. That's in our face each and every day. That's in our face when we are pulled over by the police. Whether you're a black man or a black woman, you got to think about whether th this is the day. Is this the day? That's what you're thinking about. And so to back to Dr. Powell's point, making sure that a person of color and consciousness is, um, is, is there when they pull you over color and consciousness. Now, I don't look if it's even I would rather pick consciousness over color. Let me just let me just make that very clear, because we know that some black officers, um, some black officers, they can they can treat you worse. Right. So I don't, for me, I'd rather you have the consciousness of a of a human being. Of someone that's decent, the consciousness of someone that cares about my life, the consciousness to understand that your actions have implications and ramifications, the consciousness to understand that we both want to get home. A traffic stop should not be a memorial site. I'm going to say that again. A traffic stop should not be a memorial site. Glad we got my sister Iman Heath back into the conversation. Sorry, technology hey, no, is not, is not it's the a little technical day. difficulties. It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> but all you know, and I just was making a point, Iman, that we're at this place. But like Dr. Pot was saying, you know, you hope that whoever the officer is that approaches you, that they are an officer of color and consciousness, right? But I said if I had to choose but one, I would choose consciousness. I Absolutely. don't care about the color. Absolutely. I would rather choose the person that understands that every action creates a reaction, right? Absolutely. And it's I also want a consciousness. Respect I want I don't care. You could be Asian, you could be white, you could be Latino. If you see my life as being worthy of preservation and saving, I want you to be my police officer. That's it. It's that simple. It's that simple. And I've had different interactions with uh black female black uh female officers. It I had I got more leeway with a officer of the opposite sex and color than of my own. So just because you look familiar or you may feel familiar doesn't mean we're gonna get a better uh, a better outcome, whatever the case may be. But as I was saying, we we have to start thinking of a place thinking from a different place instead of just anger. I used to be that angry black power movement person. I was the let's set fire to the rain and, and let's, let's just be destructive, but it, it doesn't get us anything but attention. And like I've said before, once we get attention, we have to keep the ball rolling. What is next? What is our plan? What is the strategy? How can we organize? And we can't just keep talking. We talk yeah. a lot. Black people yep. talk, we talk a real good, good big game. Or we're gonna make this change, we're gonna reform, reform, reform. Okay, what are the actual steps to start it? And then if you know the information, pass the information. We 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 will get to uh we'll get to a point of 
we're fed up and you know we're angry and we we got to make this change and have this change it doesn't work it doesn't work we we have to let like dr paul said we we they assume we're going to go off of emotion and simply just emotion we're not going to take the action behind it um but we have to we have to go that route being angry and talking is 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 like beating a dead horse with snacks. Oh, no. let me tell you, Iman, it's 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 really like beating a dead horse. And I'm so happy that Dr. Powell was talked about how that conversation is done on the upper levels, right? Where where they're like, oh no, they're gonna just get emotional and mm -hmm. they're gonna respond this mm -hmm. way. And I then, had no idea they were trained to know that about us. They're I trained no to know idea. that about and look and, and and I mean that just goes to show you, man. I mean. This ain't racism. This is this is this is real talk. It's right? These institutions it's study black people. Yes, they study us, right. They study how we think. They study how we behave. They study how we respond to various circumstances. You know, here in Baltimore, we live in the same city as John Hopkins Hospital and University. They study. It ain't by happenstance that John Johns Hopkins Hospital, for example, and I'm just using it as an example, that they study human behavior. And 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 it's not by happenstance that they decided to keep one of the most prestigious, renowned hospitals in the world in Baltimore. Of all places. Right? Of all of, places. Out of all places. They mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Because they study, they study people, they study black people in poverty. They study black people when there's money. I mean, they they study us, and 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 for those of us who don't think that that there is some deep study that's being done, and this is not a conspiracy theory. This is that's how policing happens. Policing is is a combination of 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 policy, but it's also a combination of psychology and mm -hmm. social science. I mean, look at it. Our social behaviors. Our social Man. behaviors count. I bet, I, you know what? I challenge black people. If we treated each other better, if we treated each other with respect, if we valued our lives the same way we want them to value value our lives, would yeah. they have to study about us? Yeah. I'm sure the analysis will change. If right. we put respect on our own lives, which we don't, something as simple as, and this is, this, it drives me crazy, littering. Why do you dump trash in your neighborhood? If something as simple as that, well, they don't care about where they live at. We got to, again, we can't change their heart. Not at all. But just from those analysis and those statistics that John Hopkins and any other uh, analysis, may, anybody analysing us may look at, we have to change how we handle ourselves, how we right. treat ourselves, talk talk about ourselves. We, right. other than poverty, keep the way we kill each other, especially in Baltimore, Nobody lives matter. We can't scream Black Lives Matter, and because I don't like your shoes, you stepped on my shoe. I'm gonna shoot you. And it's been senseless reasons as to why we kill each other. We gotta hold ourselves accountable as well. So it's, we we got a lot of work to do, and it's on both yeah, we, ends. Yeah, we gotta do better for us, and we also gotta we gotta push to 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 get some type of change because we're I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm tired. And, and the last thing, last point, as we close out, Iman, is that our children. The generation and the generations coming behind us don't deserve to carry that burden. I always think about that. My son, my daughter, they don't deserve to carry the burden of trying to figure out police brutality or why the cops treat them differently. They don't deserve that. They don't deserve that. They can let them take on new problems to take us further along, not these 50, 60, 70, 100 year old problems. No, they don't deserve that. And so we have to come to a cons consensus or at least come up with some solutions that is going to lead to it. But there, there are some big, I mean, we, 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 we working in the direction we can move forward, but we just got to, we got to move as Dr. King said, as Dr. Powell was talking about what Dr. King said, he also, Dr. King also was talking about the urgency of now. And that's the place that we're in right now in this country for black people and for marginalized and disenfranchised communities. We are literally at the urgency of now, folks. This is is either is you, you you go hard or go home, and that's and if, that's we, the and if we go we home, take. it's only going to get worse. If it's we don't go home get now, worse. it's only going to get worse. There don't pump is. the brakes, hit the gas. Right, right. There it is, Iman. I appreciate you, sis. Thank you so much for holding it down. Good to see you again. Uh, and God willing, we'll reconnect with you very, very soon. Thank you for being so good for the culture, Iman. So good to be back. Good. Absolutely. 
All right, folks, that's going to do it for us. I thank each and every one of you for being a part of the conversation with us tonight. So many of you have checked in. We want to thank our very special guest, Dr. Tyrone Powers, man, very, very powerful voice. I'll make sure that we bring Dr. Powers back on to the show to continue these discussions around policing and law enforcement. But these are the conversations that we're having, and this is why we need your support here at Black Star Network. Make sure you show us your support by going to blackstarnetwork.com. You can do that. Once you do that, folks, you can give a donation and help us continue to be an unapologetic, unfiltered voice of Black-owned media. Go to blackstarnetwork.com to make your donation. Or if you decide, if you can't make a donation, the least you can do we asking from you is just let people know that they can download the app for free, share the program, share the show, and most importantly, continue to tune in each and every day to the Black Star Network. So we appreciate your support all throughout this great, great journey that we are on to show the value of Black-owned media. So thank you for checking in for that. All right, folks, that's going to do it for me. Stay tuned at the 6 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Of course, big brother Roland Martin is going to be checking in with Roland Martin Unfiltered. Make sure y'all tune in for that great, great program. And I always enjoy watching and Brother Roland doing what he's doing. So many great videos that he's been posting about various topics. So make sure y'all check him out on YouTube and uh, on Instagram. Follow us on Instagram at Black Star Network and all of those great pl those great platforms. As you can see, you can follow me at Faraji Muhammad. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram and I'm on Facebook. And I would love to hear what you got to say. So follow me there. As always, never be afraid to challenge what's wrong. Stand for what's right while being yourself in the process. God willing, we will check in tomorrow with you for another exciting edition of The Culture right here on the Black Star Network. Peace.